Welcome to Get Paid for Your Pad, the definitive show on Airbnb hosting, featuring the best advice on how to maximize profits from your Airbnb listing, as well as real life experiences from Airbnb hosts all over the world. Welcome. We are your hosts, Josefa Kapadia and Jasper Rivers. Get paid for your pad. 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 Welcome to episode 78 of Get Paid for Your Pad. And today I am talking to John Kerr, who is an Airbnb host in the UK. So, John, welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be with you, uh, Jasper, and I, I love your uh, podcast and website, uh, Get Paid for Your Pad. And I'm really looking forward to re- referring to it in my forthcoming book. That's great. So we'll, we'll talk about your book a little bit later, but let's get started by having you give us a short background of who you are, where you grew up, and maybe a little bit about your work, and then we'll talk about how you got involved with Airbnb. Yes, certainly, uh, Jasper. So I, um, um, I'm Scottish, and um, I've spent most of my life in England. So basically, I come from the UK. Um, and I uh, have had a, a corporate career in various things, but I quit my job four or five years ago, having built up a little property portfolio. Um, so really what I am now is a professional landlord within the UK. I do an awful lot of networking in the property circles, and I also help other property people, other investors, uh, buy the right sort of property. Mm-hmm. Um, I... Uh, came across Airbnb when it was called Crashpadder.com or before they bought Crashpadder.com in London. And uh, I came across it as a user. I was using it for bed and breakfast in Hertfordshire. And I was really quite impressed with it. Um, And when I discovered that it had been Crashpadder had been taken over by Airbnb, I thought, how curious. At that point, I had a one bedroom flat in central London and that's how I started with Airbnb, a one-bedroom garden flat. Okay, and let's backtrack a little bit. So you own a number of properties that you rent out, and you also help other people buy their own properties and also renting those out? That's right. I help them get a strategy together uh, if they're thinking about becoming a property investor it, to effectively do what I have done, quit my job and um, live off property, hopefully um, with financial independence and hopefully with passive income. Although I work quite, work quite hard in getting the income up from as all of my properties and uh, my clients' properties. And you mentioned you first used Airbnb uh, in a as a bed and, bed and breakfast. Were you, were you a guest there or were you hosting? I was a guest uh, way back in, I think, 2009 and 2010. Um, And I remember being a guest several times and being really, really frustrated when the hosts um, never replied. (laughs) Yeah, that's not a good thing. Um, But even though you were frustrated with Airbnb as a guest, you did still decide to use it as, as a host. And that's because you were using another platform that was then bought by Airbnb, correct? Yes, I think Airbnb bought Crashpadder.com in um, 2011 or so, maybe a little bit later. And that was the time when I had a um, garden flat, three stops on the railway line from where the London Olympics were being held in 2012. Uh And so I listed it uh, with Airbnb. And as they say, the rest is history. So I, I was one of the first users in the UK. And so the did first you, hosts. Were, were you living in, in your flat at the time? I, I, it was my own uh, flat, a one bedroom flat, but I um, had, um, I, I, I'd found my fiance and we were due to get married. So we uh, lived together not far from there, just outside London. So they, really, this property was no longer required for me. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the Olympics must have been a great time to start renting it out. Indeed. 
I imagine you you were probably able to charge uh, some some pretty juicy rates for the uh, for well, the Olympics. Well, the strange thing is, you would think so, but I remember that my guests who came during that period weren't interested in the Olympics. They were interested. They were doing some work in London, and what that told me was that you know what, there's more than, there's more to this market than you might think. Mm -hmm. There are many other users, and I've identified at least 16 segments of the short stay market, of which holiday is just one. Wow, 16, that's a lot. Which, yes. which are the, can you name a few other major segments? Well, um, yeah, I mean, typically you would have um, contractors at the, at the, obviously you've got holiday lets and that's what everybody thinks um, of when you tell them what you're doing. But then at the top end of the market, you've got, prime city centre um, uh, 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 um, service departments. And that's that's not new. That's been going on for a while. That's high value, five star plus sort of things. But And then at the bottom, you've got, um, in one of my towns, Edinburgh, you've got simple backpackers, you know, seven to a room, bunks, etc. And sort of in between, and one of the properties that I use are, um, it, my, my market is contractors, working contractors, usually in what we would call a white van, um, and uh, they're subcontractors. So what happens is they win a contract several hundred miles from where they live, put together a team, and they prefer to be self-catered rather than to go into the local basic sort of hotel and eat and drink out. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I mean, that's just three of the markets. Right. So I think that's a good point, and I think a lot of people don't realize this because when I talk to people who are interested in doing Airbnb, one of the first things they usually say is that they don't, they're not sure if their location is good enough because they always think that the location has to be near a lot of tourist highlights. But uh, that's definitely not the case because just like you said, not everybody who uses Airbnb is on holiday. There's lots of people who use Airbnb for business, business travelers, um, like you just mentioned, the, the contractors or even people who are who are visiting family. And uh, if their family doesn't have enough space to accommodate them, um, they will they will use Airbnb as well. So it, you know, it does definitely not true that uh, a successful Airbnb listing has to be in the center of town near all the tourist highlights. That's right. In my London garden flat, which was in an area of London I'd never heard of until I bought it, um, my market was what I would describe as lone travellers uh, travelling around the world and they would have in their back pocket a contract to work for a week or two weeks in what we would call Tech City, which is a part of um, London which is developing the modern sort of um, technological uh, design. It's a, it's a slightly gritty area. And uh, they would that 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 was my so there'd be single people with this contract a bit a bit like Tim Ferriss and his four hour work week. Mm -hmm. They were tw in their late twenties, early thirties, and they were having a lovely time traveling the world before they settled down. Yeah, well, I can uh, totally relate to that. As, uh, that's what I've been doing in the last five years. But, yeah, uh, one, but, just, sorry, yeah. just to extend the the types of market, one of the markets we've never been able to get into with our bigger houses are what I would call house movers. So people who are in between houses and want to rent somewhere for a month or two, they've sold one house and they haven't yet bought the next one, hmm. or people who've been flooded out or um, they're doing some building works. And we've never been able to capture that market, but I believe it is a strong market in some areas. But those people would be looking to rent for quite a long period, right? Like one to one or two months. Whereas, yes, that's right. You yeah. say that's a long period. And in terms of my other rentals, when I'm into wrong, long term rentals, that's a relatively short period. But my right. little matrix goes from sort of like two or three nights up to a maximum of two, two or three months. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's quite a long yeah, period. Yeah, because I think the average stay on Airbnb is something like four, four or five days or something. My average stay in my Edinburgh holiday let, a two-bedroom department there, is about 4.5 nights. Right. Okay. That seems about right. But let's let's talk a little bit about your, your first listing. So you had a garden flat in London, a <clears throat> one-bedroom. What's yes. uh, What was your experience with, with Airbnb? Did you only use Airbnb or did you use other platforms as well? That was a very sensitive letting. 
Um, so I only wanted one person in it, and I used Airbnb only for obvious reasons. And I carefully selected those people. So I used all the Airbnb rules. If people hid their faces, I wouldn't accept them. If there was anything, uh, uh, any issue, that we, I mean, we were talking about £120 a night for 10 night bookings. We were talking about £1,000 per booking, and sometimes I would turn those down. And did you did you manage to get it fully booked, or how did it go in the beginning? Did, did it take a while to start off, or...? No, in the beginning it was fairly good. Um, I wouldn't say it was fully booked. I was quite well booked because, of course, the the, the Olympics would have been my my backup. Um, and uh, yeah, but I did use it from time to time, so I wasn't looking for a hundred percent booking. I don't have the figures, but I I, I took a lot of money from it, t t tens of thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a sensitive booking. Um, and because of the local environment, the local community. What do you mean? And by, it was my, what do you mean by sensitive booking? Well, the, the, the it was in a it was in a um, a walled and gated complex, um, and the um, my uh, my neighbours were kind of anxious about strangers coming in and renting because the community was quite close and quite tight. So, so I had to be. I had to be sure that anybody who came in um, didn't um, stand out or uh, was pleasant to everybody and just was was basically there as my guest. Do you know what I mean? Right. So you had to be a, bit, a little bit selective with who you allowed access to your to your house. Yeah, and that and that worked uh, by and large. So you never had any any issues, any complaints from the neighbors, or. Um. Well, <laughs> I did because I did it for so long, and eventually I I stopped it and uh, I sold that particular property. One of the issues was I took a lovely guy from Los Angeles who was travelling with a lovely little dog and um, a really quiet dog, but um, the warden for the community banged on the door and the dog started backing, barking, and they shouldn't have had a dog in there. So basically... Um, it was a bit of an issue, and I was I was remote at that time, but I got the calls, etc. You know, and that that was largely down to me because um, I was selling the property, and my agent had sent along a photographer who was trying to access it, access it, despite the fact that I cancelled the agent. They didn't cancel the photographer in time, so you can see the issues that arose. Somebody trying to get access. Okay, right. I see. And then, and then, what happened? You, but you were already you already decided to sell the apartment before. That's right. Before you I had decided, those issues, I sell that particular property and right. concentrate on my other three properties that I was putting through Airbnb and other uh, windows. And so, what what are those other three properties? Well, the main one is um, in Edinburgh, which is a two bedroom apartment. And I started that. Um, that you, you see that location is quite uh, – I, I bought that by mistake. I was working up there as a consultant. I lived in uh, uh, Kent, and uh, Edinburgh was about 450 miles away, and I was traveling at weekends. And I bought that property um, just before I quit that job, actually. So um, I, I, I just wasn't sure what to do with it. And I was staying with – somebody who had some holiday property in Edinburgh and I thought she was doing the job so, so well I said would you go and look at this um, flat at this apartment of mine and she went because I thought it was in a rather um, scruffy area that nobody would be interested in it was quite central in the old town of Edinburgh near the castle but I still thought the area was too scruffy and she said John the location is perfect people will not be concerned about the outside all you need to do is to do up the inside and make it look good. And that's exactly what I did. And she helped me get going. She did all the lettings. But I then decided I wanted to push it. So we got it to about maybe eleven to £12,000 of gross income. And I decided that I wanted to take over the marketing, having learned from her. Um, and that's what I did. And now I do all the marketing remotely. And we pushed it up from that 12000 gross income a year to um, uh, this year, I'm thinking it's going to go over 30,000. Wow, that's a pretty big improvement. 
absolutely. If I were to let that two-bedroom flat uh, apartment long term, I would probably get about £8,000 a year of rent. But of course, I wouldn't have the um, cleaning and the uh, laundry and the management costs. Yeah, so that's uh, that makes sense. I, I typically tell people who are considering doing Airbnb, who are currently doing a long term, I typically tell them that they can expect to be making about two or three times as much. So that seems to be the case in, uh, in, in your case as well. I agree with you three times what your standard long term rental would be. Uh, in my case, I think I'm making a good bit more than that now. Mm -hmm. um, because and that's because I'm I do more than Airbnb. So this year in particular, I mean, last year I got to about twenty-two thousand, and, and this year I was budgeting twenty-four, but it's going to go to twenty to, to over thirty thousand gross. And that's because I have got another three um, portals that I that I use. And do you know what? Over the last twelve, so I've got for this year from the starting the first of April twenty fifteen to the year ending March twenty sixteen, I've got twenty seven thousand pounds worth of booking in the bank. Uh, for 228 nights. So there's still a lot to go, um, but they're the difficult months of um, November, January, February and March. Um, but I'll still push that. But this year, um, I've had three, um, three portals. Airbnb started out in the lead, having got the most. Then I uh, signed up with Home Away and they came in with a whole clump of bookings for the summer of 2015 which put them in the lead, high value, longer term bookings, um, booked in advance. And then I signed up with, uh, with Booking.com in about June. And I got a flood of uh, bookings from Booking.com, which took them into the lead. But now Airbnb is back in pole position, you know, having got half my income for this year. So let's talk about uh, some of these other platforms and how they compare to Airbnb. So I know that Booking.com which is a site that I use a lot to book hotels. Um, they focus more on hotels than apartments, I thought. So, but uh, I guess I guess you can also put your your flat on on Booking.com. You can, and I have done, but uh, many other people that I know do do it, and they don't like it. I think you're quite correct, Jasper. They're for hotels, so therefore you've got to think like a hotel. You've got you've got you've got to. I think you've got to play by their rules. So what I mean by that is I like to take, um, I like to get commitment from people. So in Booking.com, they don't take any money, unlike the other platforms. So there's a contract through Booking.com, but no money is, um, is, 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 is so, the, so they can cancel. And the maximum that, that you can um, allow them to cancel is up to 14 days beforehand. So therefore, I tried to take a £100 reservation fee right at the start, maybe four or five months before the booking. But the booking.com guests don't like that. There was lots of resistance to it. Either they didn't communicate or they cancelled. So what I now do is I just simply say, do you know what? I'm going to take the booking and I'm going to expect them to pay 14 days beforehand. And if they don't, I'll take it on the chin. I'll be very careful about my, my peak periods, um, but you know, it, it's nicer to have 10 or 12 bookings and one cancellation than no bookings at all. Exactly. So I basically play according to the booking.com um, system and ask for the guests to pay 14 days in advance, which is the maximum they will allow you to do. Mm -hmm. And so how does booking.com, how do they charge you? Do they take a, a certain fixed amount Per booking, or do they take a percentage? They take fifteen percent from me. They may have other schemes, like Home Away has a variety of schemes, but Booking.com charges me fifteen percent at the end of the month. So I have a bill of several hundred pounds, depending on who has booked through them. So if I have no shows um, or can't knock, or people, if people, if people don't pay in fourteen days and don't cancel, I would need to tell Booking.com beforehand. Otherwise, I would be charged. Right. And so that, does, does it work similar to Airbnb where you can literally just go on the booking.com platform, create a listing for free? Or are there like conditions when you need to sign contracts, etc.? It's fairly straightforward, actually. I was surprised at how straightforward it was. You just 
uh, you you create your listing. It's largely tick pop tick box. So you don't get an opportunity to um, uh, to put in much flowery language or description. Although Booking dot com will put that on for you. So they and they will write the headline. So they tend to be a bit more controlling. Um, it's it's as if you're a standard commodity like a hotel. Re remember that. And also, um, uh, uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, that's that, 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 that's how you do it. And, and don't forget, you don't know it's instant book with Booking dot com, and you don't know who your guests are going to be. Right, that's, that's another a big, big difference. difference. That's a big from difference from Airbnb. Yeah, that's a big difference. So if I take my London property that I referred to, I would not have done that through Booking dot com. Airbnb was perfect. But if I take my Edinburgh property, which is a holiday let property, and the people are going to go there are going to be in holiday, I don't really mind where they come from because I know what sort of people are likely to take that for, for a minimum of four, three or four days. So it doesn't matter to me where they come from because I'm not. It's, it, there's not really much they can do that's going to be an issue. And in other locations, it might not. So I'm happy with Booking.com there being on instant book. Mm-hmm. Right, because Sorry, it's, yeah, you're, I say instant book. It's not called instant book with them. I'm I'm using an Airbnb term. Right. Booking dot com. Basically, people can just book straight away, and the first you know of it, you've got a reservation. You're basically saying, you know, the the property you have in Edinburgh, it's not it's not a place where you live yourself, and also it doesn't have the sensitivity uh, with with the neighbors, etc. So you're not as concerned to you know who you're hosting. That's right. It's, don't get me wrong, it's a quality property and I go there on holiday several times a year and love it. Um, but the nature of the guests who come, doesn't matter where they come from, what they're coming for is a holiday break in Edinburgh because it's the festival city, it's the festival capital of the world. There are more festivals going on there than ever and people just love it. So therefore I don't have the sort of guests that I consider are ever going to cause any issues. So let's talk about And in the... fact, it just, on, that, on that point, I discourage um, stag weekends and hen parties. Do you know what I mean by hen parties? So be, because they would come up from maybe a, northern England, etc. I discourage those because I, 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 my maximum is four. I don't take six. And there's a double bed. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, I, it, my listing doesn't really appeal to them. And I'm pleased about that. Mm. So if I want to throw a hen party in Edinburgh, then I have to sign something else. You have to go somewhere a little bit more um, um, uh, amenable. <laughs> okay, I'll, keep, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, it's like what we call the local Travelodge Hotel. You know, basically a, a bed in a hotel with so, not much character. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how you use several platforms and how you sort of manage that because... I'm trying to imagine, you know, you have several calendars and, you know, you want to prevent double bookings. Like, how, how do you do that? Is that, is that easy or? Um, I find it relatively um, straightforward, but it, you have to have a system and you have to apply that system. I have a checkbox form. Um, so... I do use um, iCal and the synchronization of calendars. Um, it's not perfect because of the way it, um, Airbnb, the different portals work. Um, I do it manually. So my system is a manual system um, based on a Google calendar, um, which you can sync down, etc. But I don't rely on the syncing. I do everything manually at this stage. When... I, um, as I scale that up, then that will have to be either done manually through a system by other colleagues, or I'm hoping that we'll get something which is really good, which does all of that. I'm looking at a couple of things at the moment, but I'm not an expert in this. So I'm look, going to look at something called super control, which I believe does much of this. And do you know what? I'm fairly sure that with that there is something in the market now which will do all of this for me. Um, but I, it has to be something which is pretty sophisticated and, and watches out for the glitches. And by that I mean, 
For example, you need to end your Airbnb listing in a Google Calendar the day before they check out. Whereas on the other listings, they they want they 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 go it goes to the checkout day, um, so that you could either have a duplication or a void period because of that. If you understand what I'm what I'm getting at, so there are little technical things there that are not um, IT, but they're just the way the systems work. But I I'm looking to uh, get, get to syst to systematize. If you were just using Airbnb, there would be no need for any of this. It would just be capable of being totally and utterly automated. But because you need to be careful across platforms and get your calendars right, then you need to have a system which ensures that. Have you heard of uh, an app called Booking Sync? And I've, I've, I've only just heard of it. So I'm beginning to look at things like this and work out which is, the, which is going to be the best. Okay, right. Yeah, because... I uh, I'm actually looking at it now. I I heard about this app before. It's basically an app that allows you to connect multiple accounts on multiple platforms, and it will manage. It will basically aggregate all the calendars into one, and yeah. it will uh, which makes it really easy to manage. Um, well, that would be great, and I hope you'll do a podcast with them. Um on the subject of booking synchronization. But there's another aspect to it, and that is pricing. Um, so, for example, on booking.com, I will put my prices, because of the 15%, about 15 to 20% higher than, um, say, Airbnb. And, um, and on, 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 uh, on, on HomeAway, I, I might do the same. So what I'd be looking for is some, and I'd want to, I want to change my, look at my pricing every week, and I'd like something that puts the pricing into all the platforms that I list on, which is holiday lettings, late rooms, Wimdo, which doesn't work for me yet, Airbnb, Booking.com, a local um, uh, platform called Edlets, and Home Away. And I might use another one, another one or two this year. Um, so I, what I would want is something that actually updates my pricing um, uh, relative to my um, my requirements for that website um, uh, on a weekly basis. So that's quite a challenge. Yeah, I can imagine. Like I I use Beyond Pricing for my Airbnb listing, so I I never have to even worry about it because it updates uh, my calendar every day with optimal pricing. But uh, if you have uh, multiple listings and also multiple platforms, then it must take a bit of time to to adjust all the prices, especially if you want to use dynamic pricing where you're pricing higher in the high season or you're pricing higher because of local events. Um, it must be a bit of work. Well, it's the only bit of work you really need to do the way I do it because I'm, I'm in Bedfordshire in just north of London and my Edinburgh property is 350 miles away. So marketing is all I have to do. And it's well worth my while doing that if it can earn me an extra £10,000 a year from one property. Um, so, how, yes, so how do you calculate I, prices? I beg your pardon, Jasper? So how do you calculate uh, prices? Do you use one price for the whole year or...? Right. Um, <laughs> firstly, there's no absolute formula, but my rule of thumb is £30 per person per night um, and double that for peak seasons. Um, and don't worry too much about, um, well, you've got to be careful about special events. We get caught out in our property in southwest Scotland with all the golf open championships that happen in in Troon and Turnberry and we don't we we know about those because suddenly a year hence we get bookings and we decline those and <laughs> fix our pricing accordingly okay and so this, basically uh, some, I, pri some... I priced by feel mm -hmm. so on uh, airbnb also, you have to be careful also, with cancelling uh bookings and then raising the price because airbnb will will um will punish you for, in the, for that uh, by lowering your ranking. Now, is that, so, uh, is, that, uh, is that correct? That's news to me because I thought Airbnb, they, they liked it when you decline a, um, a, 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 an offer, when they decline a booking. They like you to do that quickly, so they don't penalize you for the, for, the, for the declining, but I didn't realize that they then would penalize you if you declined an offer and then put your price up. I hadn't realized that. Well, it depends. I mean, you can you can definitely decline um, inquiries, but once people make a booking, 
then you know if you cancel it, that's when oh, they really penalize I've had, you. I've, uh, you're absolutely right. I've had to cancel two Airbnb bookings because I made a mistake, not because of the pricing. And fortunately, Airbnb were very good about it both times. But it was a real hassle, lots of telephone calls. And they warned me that uh, it would affect my ranking. But on this occasion, they said it, it won't do that. And probably, I don't know why that was, um, but I got away with it. But I would never, ever take a booking and then seek to cancel it for the Airbnb. Avoid that like the plague. Yeah. And that's why getting your, getting your diary and your system right is so important. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're quite right. Don't, don't cancel. So... Let's talk about some experiences that you have with Airbnb guests. I always like to ask uh, uh, the guests on the show what their worst and their best experience has been. Um, right. Shall we start with my worst experience? Um, and it was a complaint. And it was in Edinburgh. And I knew it was coming um, uh, because she had told me about it um, after as she checked out um, and she managed to find three things all of which were legitimate um, and uh, I, 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 one was the state of the bins outside remember I told you about the area it was at this is the rubbish bins not much I can do about the other was we had some mice in the flat um, Edinburgh old property it's a common it's a common it's a common problem uh, and it breaks out and we deal with it but you know what it's not good for a complaint. So my issue was, how am I going to handle this? It's legitimate. And do you know what? It was my first one in several years. And I went on to the Edinburgh Airbnb host group and explained what I thought was coming. I got tremendous support and guidance from that group. The Airbnb host groups are really good. And they they, they told me exactly how to handle it, you know, and just to, to learn from the experience, to to thank the person for their feedback and to be very sort of um, not to be challenging or derogatory in any way. Um, and that, that was that was that was um, that was difficult, but it didn't really affect my listing very much. Uh, some people say you need to get a few complaints, actually, if you've got too much good people distrust it. Um, the best experience, um, I think my best experience is not so much with a guest, but it was the installation of a lockbox or a key safe about two and a half years ago on the wall of the block in my outside my Edinburgh apartment and no longer requiring my um, local housekeeper to have to do check-ins. Check-ins are really, really laborious. And if you can automate this, it makes all the difference. In fact, it makes it worth doing. Whereas I've had to do check-ins in the London where I had to pay somebody £20 an hour to wait three hours uh, to do a check-in. Well, you know, that can kill the profit. Um, so that lockbox or key safe uh, with a code where they get the keys, and we installed that two and a half years ago, and we've never looked back since. In fact. We, neither my housekeeper nor I, have seen a guest for two and a half years. And that's true. I communicate with them online by text. And in fact, as we have this call, somebody from one of my properties has just sent in an email, which I'll need to deal with in a moment. Um, and uh, that's just great. And more and more people are accepting that way of working, which I'm pleased to say. Yeah, the key uh, lockbox is definitely a great solution. And there is also even more sophisticated solutions these days. And there's a there's a lock called Lockitron and one called Open Sesame. And these are locks that you can control through your iPhone. So you have an iPhone app and you can send the code to your guests and then they can use the code on their iPhone to to open the lock. Uh, I hope I'm I'm hoping I'm hoping I'm explaining it right. But it's 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 something like that. It's something like a remote controlled lock where you can change the code every time so that uh, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, guests uh, telling all the people the code and those people then going into your house. You can change it every single time. And uh, yeah, you're totally right. It, uh, it definitely takes away the need to, to do the check-ins. Although there's also a lot of hosts who will tell me that the check-ins 
are uh, are of a lot of value because the sort of Air, people choose Airbnb for the personal touch and they like to sort of meet the host and get to know the person a little bit, uh, have a little chat, etc. But uh, it's it's definitely not necessary. Uh, I, I think so. Those are those are good solutions. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what I would say on that, and first, first of all, thank you for the, that's Locketron and, and Sesame, Open Sesame. I look at those because um, that, that's important. But I think on Airbnb, if you're a remote host of an entire um, home like I am, it's going to be quite difficult to get 80% um, uh, a, a five star to get yourself super host. And I, but I think if you're room only, obviously you would probably need to, to welcome your guests. And I, I think there's a difference between the room only Airbnb hosts and the entire home uh, property Airbnb hosts. And I noticed that on the London Hosts Forum, they're not particularly keen on what they would describe as um, landlords and investors like me uh, doing this because they see their service as being completely different and they'll be the ones who will get the super host um, uh, badge I suspect because I know some of them who go overboard and provide free alcohol to their guests um, and I don't understand it they're doing it I think they're not doing it for the money there they're doing it for some some other purpose yeah for sure uh, I think people have different reasons for doing Airbnb I mean you know the financial yes. benefit is is probably a, a very uh, big reason for most hosts but there's also uh there's also things like couch surfing right where people are are um you know letting other people stay in their house for free so there's definitely a lot of people who just enjoy to meet other people from from other countries and who enjoy the company that's right so uh, so yeah i think definitely there's is different. I, I did it. I went to um, somewhere, a, a city in uh, the UK as a, an Airbnb guest three weeks ago. And I think the big issue um, that there is, is the use of the kitchen. Um, and it seems to me from my limited um, thing there, where, they, where you've got a live-in host, you know, um, sometimes they've adapted the house and it's not quite as homely as you want because they're trying to do it commercially and the use of the kitchen is the big issue and some people seem to have it taped when they say anything less than three nights stay microwave only um, but if if it's for longer periods then we'll work out a system whereby you can have a cupboard and do all of that so john you mentioned you have written a book about airbnb let's let's talk about that Yes, it's an e-book. It's part. It's basically designed to be the annex of a larger book I'm writing on the short stay markets. Um, but it, my book is on the rise of Airbnb, and it's particularly designed for people who want to understand what Airbnb is, how it works, and most importantly, how it works for them. Um, so it's a sort of seven chapter, sixteen page uh, book um, on the Airbnb story. And uh, all the detailed aspect of um, if you're putting up a listing, you can see all the aspects of how it how it works uh, from the you can pick up that in literally about two or three minutes reading. So for those who are interested in in reading your book, how can they get it? All they need to do is to um, go onto my website, um, which is www yourpartnerinproperty.co.uk that's www.yourpartnerinproperty.co.uk and then there's a pop-up box just send me a message to that pop-up box it's contact me box okay great so, so for those who are interested in, in reading your thoughts on, uh, on on airbnb and how to get started with it uh, go ahead and visit the website and you can get the book for free great well thank you so much for your time john it's been an interesting conversation and uh i wish you all the all the luck uh, with uh with your airbnb listings and your properties and your business and for the listeners thank you for listening and of course uh, next week there will be another episode of get paid for your pad and if you want to learn more about Airbnb hosting, there is all sorts of resources available on getpaidforyourpad.com. So go ahead, take a look. And if you have any questions, you can always send an email at info at getpaidforyourpad.com. 
So John, thanks very much. And everybody else, we'll see you next time. Yeah.